Welcome again, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science, and I'll post this again for the Tawahado Bible Study, because the main subject of today will be scripture. As always, if you support these efforts, feel free to go to patreon.com slash aksum, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash a-k-s-u-m. You could also join the YouTube channel directly at even a dollar or five dollars a month. Today, I have with me as my special guest, the very Reverend Father Timothy Lowe. Welcome to my podcast, Father Timothy. Deacon Hanak, it's nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Um, my my pleasure. Uh, the kind of chasson uh, d'etat uh, of this episode is uh, you're acting as the chairman of the Orthodox Center of the Advancement of Biblical Studies, which has a very close relationship with the podcast network, of course, that I'm involved with, the, the Ephesus School Network, very, um, a very back and forth relationship between those two organizations. And I'm always encouraging people to listen to all of those podcasts and to go and see all of the publications, journals, exegetical notes of OCABs. In fact, back in 2014 uh, is how I got into this, uh, this world, uh, coming from my uh, Afro-Asiatic part of the church into the, the, the foraying into the Greek parts of studying scripture, um, I found the exegetical notes very helpful even before the first Bible as Literature podcast began. And then when I saw they started a podcast, I was I was there from the very beginning. You could find me calling in as a listener and my voice is recorded uh -huh. on one of those, those early episodes. But so are you. I, I looked it up to see when I remembered the first time I, I heard of you, and it looks like it was uh, sometime January 2015, which is about a year into uh, uh, their their now very prolific series of, of podcasts. So I wonder if you could uh, start off by telling my listeners, um, a bit, because you're not a cradle, how you got into uh, Orthodox Christianity and the study of scripture, and then... Uh, Weave, weave us somehow into either Ephesus School or OCABs, whichever came first? You know, some of us have uh, really odd stories, and uh, uh, my life seems to be a, a gathering of all of them together. Uh, I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska, in a very mm -hmm. waspish background. So uh, non-denominational Protestantism in my teen years, very actively involved uh, in ministries related to high school kids, as was my father. Oh. And uh, uh, even though he was just a businessman. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, in that setting, the Bible is everything. There is no tradition per se, and there is no liturgy. It's just, just a gathering, a hymn sing, and a long sermon, and some prayers and whatnot. So any sense of liturgy and all the sort of the, the Byzantine grandeur and whatnot is completely foreign to me. Not only for, I didn't even know it existed. Mm -hmm. And, and within that sort of Protestant framework, uh, especially if you, if you're not in a traditional, more sort of, uh, mainline Protestant or Lutheranism or Anglicanism or whatnot, uh, uh, you, you're completely oblivious to history and you don't ask historical questions related to Christianity. It's just you, it's about you and Jesus in the Bible. And, uh, with that, I uh, uh, was an underachiever in high school. You know, high school is something to get through with the least amount of work possible. And, you know, if you have brains, which, you know, my parents were smart, so, you know, their, their children have brains, you, you can find ways to cut corners. So I wasn't a classic underachiever. And so after a semester of college, I said, this is just high school glorified. I, I, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. So I went uh, after the after this was 1972. I then went to the University of Maryland campus where my dad had contacts with with uh, a ministry on the University of Maryland. So I worked with that for a few months and met this guy who was taking a group of college students to Israel. Mm -hmm. And um, the oddity of this, and this this shows you both the, the, the zeal and the ignorance and naivete all wrapped in together. It's a strange sort of uh, trinity. Uh, uh, this group was rooted in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, they were going over there as a discipleship mission program to convert 
Jews and Muslims to Jesus. Again, not knowing anything whatsoever about what that entails. It's just campus crusade, four spiritual laws, you know, save them, bag them, go to the next one because you're guaranteed eternal salvation once you accept Jesus. And, and I make fun of it, obviously, but, but you know, the zeal and the sincerity was, was there, but, it was, but the ignorance level was, was, was off the charts, as you, as you will see if I tell you even a few more parts of the story. Nonetheless, uh, so I found myself hitching a plane, meeting this group of whom I knew not a single one, uh, in DC, flying to London, uh, where the director of this, this summer program, who was from Tennessee, married an English gal, so he was now based in London, and we drove cross country. Now, I grew up in Nebraska, middle, never traveled my entire life. I think we went on one vacation to California to visit my mom's relatives. That's it. So all of a sudden, my, my small Nebraska, sort of middle class, very white, uh, world was expanding. And I had never had a desire to travel. It just sort of happened. You know, uh, it's sort of like an avalanche. You take one one step and uh, or one rock begins to to fall and all of a sudden it slowly, slowly erodes away. And then all of a sudden you're and this took me to to Jerusalem. And you, you didn't have to be convinced to go to Jerusalem. That was no, no, something no, no. you were I open was, to. I was I was I was open to it and I had no plan. I had no plan. You know, and I, you know, I had the litany of my mother said, you know, you're going to be a bum, right? You, 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 you didn't, you quit college after semester. God gave you brains. You're just going to be a bum. And my dad saying, oh, you know, the Lord is guiding him. Just let him be. Let him be. You're going to be a bum. Oh no, 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 the Lord, no, you're going to be a bum. So anyway, <laughs> so uh, uh, you know, I, I bought into it. I bought into it. So. We landed, uh, we took a, a minibus over uh, from London all the way to, to uh, Athens and, uh, and uh, went through what was then Yugoslavia and whatnot, down to Thessaloniki. And, and uh, when we got in Athens, the, the boat taking us, you know, from, from, uh, to Athens to Haifa was delayed a week. So we got stuck in Athens for a week. Which was great because I mean, obviously we got to see Athens and we were, you know, we were basically camping on the beach and whatnot. And uh, uh, but even there, I didn't ask historical questions. I had read St. Paul's letters to the Thessalonians and whatnot, but it, you know, and the first time I saw this guy in a cassock and a hat and a beard, I, I said, "Oh my God, what is that? What is that?" Not again. It was the sheer ignorance of not even knowing how to ask the right questions. You go to the Acropolis, whatnot. No, we were on the beach. We were talking to Greeks, trying to, to had this sort of gimmick of encountering them, engaging them, and so on and so forth, trying to tell them about, about Jesus. So, mm -hmm. you know, in retrospect, it's rather humorous because who would have foreseen that I would be an Orthodox priest someday? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to cut this short story. Needless to say, we, we made it to Jerusalem and tried to do the same things, talking to Jews and Arabs and whatnot. And it never occurred that we should even learn a word of Hebrew or a word of Arabic. Again, it was this mental bubble that 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 was not malicious, but just ignorant, you know, to place all of this in some sort of context. We knew nothing of Islam, nothing of Judaism per se and whatnot. So anyway, so what happened is uh, I... Uh, you know, the summer was ending, and uh, I still didn't have plans for the fall. Everybody else was in college going back. And uh, I, uh, I, uh, we were living with a Baptist missionary, American. And to this day, I don't know how it happened, but he said, well, why don't you stay and study Hebrew? Now, I, obviously, you know, I knew of biblical Hebrew, but I had, mm -hmm. would, never thought of actually studying it. And so I said, Okay, so I make this major life decision, but as simple as that, okay, that, 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 that thread is, you know, later on, I did the same thing with getting married at age 20, but that's another problem. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, this, this also this sort of, but honest, genuine trust in God, that somehow that was always in the, 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 that it was part of, 
your understanding. And uh, needless to say, I called my, my parents up and asked permission to stay. There's my mother again. Don't let that crazy kid do that. Don't let that crazy kid do that. You know, and, and in Protestants, you got to know how to play your cards right. Because once you play the God card, it becomes not a discussion be between you and your parent, be between them and God. You know, God is calling me to do this. Okay. Now, take that for what is that faith on? It shows the mentality. They left. I stayed. I jumped into modern Hebrew language program. Um, it was modern Hebrew. It wasn't. Yes. It wasn't the, no, no. It was. It, it was the immigrant program the Israelis wow. excel at, at at because they they were assimilating so many immigrants with so many. Mm -hmm. I was in a class of thirty five people, and there were probably fifteen languages in that class. So it's intensive Hebrew only, no translation. You just start a total immersion five five hours a day, five days a week, and so on. So, but then of course the seventy three war comes comes along, and uh, that was an experience in itself. But just to show you how, 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 how life was so different, we didn't have access to phones. It's not like I could call home and, you know, here, we can, we can talk to anybody in the world. We just dial a number and we're FaceTiming or, or Skyping or, or, or whatever. Uh, and uh, God knows what I put my parents through because uh, I was in the middle of a war and uh, it was on Yom Kippur. And you know, I'm, I'm telling you strange, 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 strange stories. I'm, living on the Arab side of East Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives and with a Baptist missionary and his best friend, a Pentecostal missionary. So, and they're, they're like Israel, Israel, every, you know, God, this is ordained by God and whatnot. So when Israel's getting attacked, it's like they were on their knees praying all night, you see, and I'm just sort of taking this all in, you see, and, uh, uh uh, even though we're in a blackout and we're living in, 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 in the Arab side of Jerusalem. Needless to say, I, uh, I started to finish my program. I met an Orthodox priest one day at a Bible study about the end of the world, you know, <laughs> Revelation, Daniel. I mean, all this stuff. And I, yeah. you, you, uh, you can't imagine what was going on in the, in the early 70s. And there I saw this strange guy. Again, Pat, Cassock, big red beard. And I said again in my jeans, Adidas, and longish hair, oh, my God, what is that? Well, a few days later, this guy knocked on the door of where I lived because we lived halfway up the Mount of Olives. He lived on the top. And I had been in Palestine long enough to know basic basic uh, hospitality now. See, not, not you just sort of, uh, read, do I say, sort of dumb American. Someone knocks on the door, you invite them in, you make them tea. And uh, he was visiting my friend. They were friends. And I was staying with this missionary. And he began to talk. And all of a sudden, he opened up the world of, of, of church history, the world uh, of, of apostolic writings from the, starting in the second, third century. All of this was intriguing. But you can see this was a very sort of pregnant time in my life because my whole world was turned upside down and expanding because now I was learning languages, uh, first Hebrew, then later on Arabic on the street because I was living amongst Arabs. And then, then, then Eastern Christianity, which I was totally ignorant of. So, to make a long story short, that began what was a, a journey that would uh, go on for two years. I would come back and visit my mother at her request on Christmas, and then uh, the second time, I uh, hadn't seen my wife, who was to be my future wife, but two weeks and two years, and I said, "Let's just get married." And she says, "Okay, let's just get married." 1920, no money, no nothing. We get married and. And uh, that begins a story. And ultimately, it, by, by uh, 77, uh, we had converted and we were back in Jerusalem with two kids now. Which uh, jurisdiction did you end up first well, that, converting? Well, uh, this is, this is you, you can't make this stuff up. The Church <laughs> of the East. What do you know oh, about the no Nestorian way. Church of the East? <laughs> Absolutely. They're my favorite. Oh well, then you know this 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 crazy priest we met was Canadian. He was a, he's a serial converter. Mm -hmm. He started off as as an as an Anglican, then converted to Catholicism, and then went over and went to the Melkites and studied at the Melkite seminary, and then from the Melkites he went to the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate, and then from there, each one he you know he was he was uh, you know there's we could say he was a little bit crazy brilliant crazy that brilliant kind of craziness but but always nothing was perfect so 
He left then the Greek patriarchate because they had a fight, and then he uh, went to the Church of the East, flew to uh, Tehran. Yeah, he took that look toward the East very seriously because that yes. movement you're describing, it's not, if you look at it kind of linguistically, he's he's traveling further and further East, further and further away from the empires of uh, yes, the Church yes. of Empire. It's, it's and, interesting. Uh, and he was a brilliant linguist, so he already knew Hebrew and Arabic and Greek, and now he was learning Aramaic. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so here I am in 1977. This is going to get to Father Paul and Ocap really quick. So it's, uh, it's <laughs> take your uh, time, take your time. the The Syrian Church of the East, by the way, as an aside, what I always tell my audience: the 66% uh, of a book, which is called the Book of Monks, which is given to all the monks and ex mm. expected that they all read, are writings from the Church of the East. A oh. third of it is Isaac the Syrian, yeah, uh, whom yeah. we call Marisak. Right. And the other one is, uh, we call Aragawi Manfasawi, which is uh, John Saba, the, the spiritual elder. Yeah. And that's oh. two thirds of the oh. Ethiopian monastic writings, is the is straight up the Church of the East. Right, right. Well, that's that's nice to hear. So uh, uh, when we so you 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 had that in seventy seven you said the so well in, in seventy five Lisa and I converted and uh, uh, we were in Jerusalem he, there was no community of the Church of the East in Jerusalem he was just he was just canonically linked to them uh, and uh, so we used a baptistry from the Anglican Cathedral and it was myself my wife, Lisa, and an Israeli woman, we converted together. I had been baptized as a Protestant, but he said, just in case, just in case, let's re-baptize, whatever. You know? <laughs> so anyway, we were all received. And then in 77, uh, it was time to go to school. I had never been in an Orthodox church in America. And the only thing I knew of Orthodox seminaries were the books of Father Schmemann, Mind, Orphan, whatnot, all of which we had, and I had read, but I had read them. I knew nothing about the jurisdictionalism, the mm -hmm. infighting of the Orthodox in this in this country. And uh, and so I wrote them out of the blue, and uh, uh, I want to come study. I'm 23 now. I'm, I'm actually expecting the second child. and uh, uh, And they kept saying no. You need to finish, come to this country, get established in a local parish, all basic wisdom, uh, get familiar, uh, finish your college degree, and then come for the MDiv program. And uh, I kept saying in my innocent way, no, you don't understand. I need to come. Now. I don't even care about degrees. Just I just want to study. And they kept saying no. And, uh, you know, just so... Finally, we were having, you know, we were due to have a, a, our second child, and we had to decide: Are we going to have the child in Israel? Or are we going to are we going to go go back to the states? Because at one point you had to stay, you could travel. So we decided to travel. Came back, and we're in Colorado. Uh, we're staying with my parents, and uh, and then I'm wrestling with Saint Vlad's over the summer, trying to convince them to to let me come. And you know the, the obstacles were insurmountable were, were quite insurmountable. Like how are you going to afford it? How are you going to live? You're you're you're, you're going to have two kids, you know, age two and under, uh, and uh, and you know it's not like they, they, there wasn't student housing for married students at, at St. Vlad's at this time. Everybody had to get apartments in in the area, and all of which practical concerns of which I didn't pay any attention to. Uh, make a long story short finally they said well we have a collegiate program we have a relationship with with local colleges you can take their courses get your degree but also be a part of the community take courses at st vlad's on an undergraduate and they'll accept language courses and religious courses and whatnot uh and i said great so the baby hadn't come anyway it wasn't like i could do anything so our second daughter was born and Middle of August, three days later, I'm driving a U-Haul, tra a car with a U-Haul trailer. It's about the size of, I had a bed, a desk, and a chair. Because that, that, that's all we had. We didn't have anything. Anyway, the bottom line is, is we started a seven years, a six year stint at St. Vlad's. And uh, we're great years, fantastic years. Uh, 
Uh, and those really were our catechetical years because again, we were living in an odd situation. I mean, mm -hmm. can you imagine an American, two Americans, a Canadian in a makeshift chapel in an old rundown Arab house uh, <laughs> with a makeshift altar and he's insisting church of the East that we do the liturgy in Aramaic Right. I mean, the language of Jesus. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But here, and 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 he, he wanted to do it four thirty in the morning on Sunday because you know why waste time? You know, let's mm -hmm. just get this. Through. And 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 so it had nothing of the aesthetics. It was just sort of red, and uh, uh, we finally white. Oh, he didn't it. know the the chanting in Aramaic. Well, he just didn't do it. Yeah. So we knew nothing of it. We knew nothing mm -hmm. of of sort of the 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 byzantine or or, or mm -hmm. russian music and and, and the yeah. liturgy and whatnot and uh, uh so that's those years were our catechetical years and uh uh but the time i but by the time i had started the the, the masters of divinity program i'd already had two years of greek I had I already learned modern hebrew and so the jump to biblical hebrew was really quite easy and i started that mm -hmm. also in college so unlike all of my, my colleagues who knew nothing of the biblical language, and I had already studied Latin as well. So I just was I wow. was just enthralled with it. Because I was at a Lutheran school, so I could uh, college, I could take all these language courses mm -hmm. and take take the take the Greek at St. Vlad's. And uh, so I was quite prepared for Father Paul. And uh, because Father Paul showed up at St. Vlad's uh, in 77 as well. That was his first year, my first set. And, uh, you know, I was living in a, we found an apartment in a house that had four apartments. So there was uh, four other married, three other married couples. We don't know if they had kids. And when Father Paul arrived, he kicked up a lot of dirt. The students couldn't stand him because his teaching style was not, uh, you know, a la Americana. It was very European, very, very, you shut up. You don't ask questions. You could, if you don't understand, you can ask me. You don't challenge me. I don't discuss scripture with you. You don't know a thing. You just got, I get paid to teach. Sit and write. Sit, take notes. And if you're not here, when you see that door shut, that's when the class has started. You cannot come in. In other words, he set down such strict rules and demanded such procedures that no other professor, and so the students were just, just up in arms, just up in arms. And all I knew was that here was this, this Arab Palestinian, you know, uh, and I was just delighted because I had just come from there. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, uh, and I'm sure you let him know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, you know, Father Paul is, is, uh, you know, uh, we're talking personal things. I mean, his, 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 his bark is much louder than his bite. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you know, but it's he's got a large, you know, he's can be quite demanding and forceful. And uh, but what I discovered when I took my first class with him, and this is really, the, I think, the key that has fueled my involvement with him since '77. So you know, do your math. That okay. is a that is a forty-four years. Yes, forty-four years. Uh, very... Was I. I discovered that he could teach me things nobody else could in the scripture. What was that first class? Was it a Hebrew Bible course or was it a New Testament? No, it course? was it was just an intro to Old Testament. Mm -hmm. He was he was doing just Old Testament. Later mm -hmm. on, he, he 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 was allowed after you know. I got Father Paul in his thirties. Those of you that got him in his forties, fifties, and sixties got a better version, <laughs> a developed version. Uh, and uh, yeah, I know he was he was only 34 when he got there. So uh, but I knew he, he, he opened up my eyes to things and approach to scripture uh, that I had not encountered before. And so my instinct was sit down, shut up, take notes. Even if you don't understand completely what he's saying or how or his his approach, his methodology of exegesis, just take notes. Other students sometimes would fight with themselves, argue, or they want to want to, you know, because Father Paul is very pejorative towards you know certain 
approaches and theology and philosophy and whatnot. He has, he has no, no use for it. And that, that developed over time. So uh, it was there, De Deacon Elias, that that, uh, that that was the key for me. And, uh, and I trusted as a student, okay, here's a teacher. Just trust the teacher and do the work. And I think the fruit speaks for itself. So in that sense, in terms of OCABs and membership, uh, I'm the chairman by default because I'm the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've been around the longest. Nobody from my from my my period is active in OCAPS. No one. It's all it's all the the, the what I'm calling now the next generation. Well, the Mark Bulos, you know, those people now getting to be fifty in their late forties and whatnot. That that uh, that the the ongoing work and development. Uh, so I'm a bit of a, of a a relic in that sense. Okay. And now having retired, I'm more of a relic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what does re retired mean uh, from from active uh, clerical yes, duty or yes, from yes. producing works or? No, no, no. I I I I, uh, I retired and at uh, from my last parish, which was in Worcester, Mass. It was an Albanian ethnic parish, which was just absolutely the best, the best. Uh, before that, I was I was running an institute in Jerusalem for mm -hmm. about four years, and then uh, so it uh, uh, it's See, th those things are those things are interesting. You and I are not the type, and I want to go back to approaches to to scripture and related to the the beginning of your story because I I think there are some threads to connect there. But on on this point, um, the Ethiopian Church is. Uh, a, a lot less formalized, I think, in, in many respects than than other communions, um, by I'm virtue of just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, by virtue of how periphery we have been. So yeah. when you when you you know when you use the word retirement, I thought I knew what you understood. I thought I understood what you were saying, but it's a you know it's a concept that's really totally foreign. I have a a friend who um, yeah, I won't name now, but he I remember he tried to do this novel thing and uh you know speak with a, one of the the bishops who's involved in his ordination and and kind of go through like a formal procedure right, right. of retirement and the bishop was confused he was like what are you talking about <laughs> like you've never even heard of it you know there's no such thing right uh, right they, you just <laughs> like if there is a retirement it's there's nothing formal about it and it's more the person sort of just fades away on their own but there, there are no form, formal processes right, or procedures right, right, or anything right. like it so it's uh it's like i i don't think that word is even used at all no it no just... it's 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 americana <laughs> let's be honest let's be honest okay and uh and i never thought i would retire officially uh from parish work just because you couldn't afford to retire. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. like we make lots of money, right? You can stash it away. A uh, secret might be to marry well, but that's a different discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yes. I think about this in the life of N.T. Wright, who I'm a fan of uh, from the Anglican yes. tradition, mm -hmm. which you've mentioned a couple of times. Of, I've got his uh, one of his translations of the, the New Testament. Um, obviously, all translations uh, fail, but I, I, I like the efforts taken by an individual to do it all on their own versus a committee. I think it produces a, a, a strange story, like the strange stories you're, you're telling us. And one of the things I've seen in his life is that he was what the Bishop of Durham, but retired from that kind of active parish ministry so that he could, you know, mm -hmm. produce in his, his research. And it's, it's more just like re refining and, and defining your vocation. Yes. And, you know, let's, let's, let's rephrase that. I have, more control over my discretionary time therefore i can do the things i really want to do <laughs> oh, and uh, at some point you realize okay it, it someone else needs to come mm -hmm. i have other interests and i'm in a situation uh, there's obviously a whole bunch of factors that make comes into making that personal decision yes uh, you know in terms of let's, you know, a, a large family and whatnot and uh, and helping your children do things that you weren't able to help it, help them with earlier on because you're so busy. And if you're a perfectionist, it means you're obviously constantly guilt ridden. <laughs> there's more I could do. Does that do better? Yeah, that sucks. yeah there's um, 
another difference between the Ethiopian church and uh, the American version versus the one back in Ethiopia, there are more avenues like what you're describing where people have a lot more opportunities, you know, especially yes. because church and state were united historically, you know, there were people who become chroniclers, you know, they're basically historians. Like you could, right, I mean, right. the, the amount of different options, whereas here uh, in America, there there seems to be only one vocation, which is performing the liturgy and, and singing the liturgy. And there, there really, there are a few people who preach, but outside of that, like really the only vocation that people see is, is that, and um, it's, it's, it won't, it won't be a total secret to people in my audience, but, you know, being a deacon and having been married at, at this point, you know, the, the conversation of uh, discerning the priesthood often comes up. And what I tell people is, you know, uh, maybe fat chance 10 to 15 years from now uh, as John Chrysostom was dragged. But in the meantime, you know, e exhausting every single last other option in, in finding discretionary time the way that you've described. And I think, I think more people, especially in the clergy, need to hear that there are uh, options because I think some of the, the friction and, and some of the, the greatest scandals in the church happen when, when people feel uh confined in a in a, in a certain uh, path or route that that may not uh, quite, uh yeah quite he, he was, yeah confined word of, of mine is trapped and uh i've been blessed to have such a broad opportunity of experience mostly connected you know seven years of our life have been spent in in, in jerusalem environs for example and with that comes a, a some experiences and and meeting of people and networking and whatnot uh also had during various times secular jobs on the side because you had you had to feed your family and raise them and whatnot and that required additional income so and so in that sense uh, uh uh it is nice to have the time and you know now we can talk a little bit about the bible it's all about yes. the scripture and, and the possibility to do things that you didn't have the time to do because you had administrative and pastoral responsibilities. And, uh, uh, and it's nice to uh, pass that on to Father Mark, who took over for me at, in Worcester. So Beautiful. Yeah, so one of the threads I want to tie back from the early part of your story to what you're talking about now with your encounter with Father Paul Nadim uh, Tarazi is this... Um, uh, in when I teach my Sunday school students, when I do my biblical podcast, uh, there's something that we emphasize uh, that some people want to underemphasize and others claim people overemphasize the kind of early Christianity biblical interpretations were kind of categorized into this Semitic thinking and, and Greek thinking to this school of Alexandria and the school of Antioch. Interestingly enough, in, in Aksum, in Ethiopia, the uh, initial bishopry through Athanasius the Great kind of comes through the Copts, who are very much Greek. Right. However, the school of biblical interpretation was always thoroughly Antiochian. And there are several scholars in the English language who've, who've recognized this uh, uh, as well. And I think, you know almost like being a Semitic environment almost compels you to, to, to think in that way, how certain languages um, color that. But, but I wonder if, if you see these connections, especially I, I see these connections, you know, from, um, from the Greek languages to the, to Latin, to, uh, you know, English and German, which are the main languages of, you know, the Protestant Reformation. You talk about this early missionary work and the idea of, you know, praying Jesus into your heart that where, where um, the, the life lived, the applied knowledge or the applied wisdom in life, the behavioral, uh, lifelong behavioral changes in, in growing close to God maybe is, is less emphasized. And it's more about what, you know, specific thoughts you have in your head. I don't know if you see a, a connection there, if I'm, if I'm grasping at, at, at straws, but I, I, I tend to see uh, a thread there, and I wonder how your your view of the Bible throughout all this time that you're talking about has changed. Because you said you started off passionate about the Bible. Here you are, 44 years later, still passionate about the Bible, 
but you've you've come to take a lot of you know exegetical notes and and a lot of that so i'm i'm wondering in what ways has that changed uh over over this this time you know my my early protestant background was a strange mixture okay we knew nothing of alexandrian and, and philosophy and whatnot but we automatically mimicked in a certain sense their spirituality without knowing it okay on the other hand there was we we were we were either we were biblicists i mean there wasn't anything else and so it was all about commentaries and and uh little little early on understanding about Greek and Hebrew as, as, as the languages we needed to study and whatnot and become familiar with. Uh, but then in the end, and this was the killer, which brought us back to, was we always wanted to theologize. I mean, even when these extemporaneous prayers, be it in church or with a prayer group in a house or whatnot, were theological. I mean, and, and the task, even on your prayer, was to impress everybody with your biblical and therefore your synthetic theological knowledge. And so the, the temptation of, of theologizing, philosophizing in a biblical sort of a, a way, uh, was always there. And, and it was the legacy that, that brought me to the Eastern Church because it took me two years because I was wrestling with the theology, mm -hmm. okay? And, and you know, based upon biblical text, because you root your, your theology in the, in the Bible. Uh, but at the end, it was trying to figure everything out to see if I actually could believe their teaching on the Eucharist. And, and liturgy was a foreign language to me completely. And then the idea of icons and idolatry and all these, all this sort of classical Protestant hangups uh, about how to, how to engage in worship. And, uh, and then what do you do with priests and, and sacraments and whatnot? But in the end, this is where Father Paul saved myself from myself, was uh, uh, the focus on exegesis, you know, the Antiochian school. And this is when I had said this statement earlier that I knew he could teach me things that no one was specifically just deal with the text. Look at the text. What is the text saying? Don't project into it. And, and that, you know, not with the sophistication articulation that he has 20, 30 years after he started teaching, because in that sense, you know, uh, uh, his articulation of it, because he was just teaching intro to, you know, so, you know, how are you going to teach in two semesters a whole intro to the Old Testament? It's an impossibility, specifically the Old Testament, because we're ignorant of the Old Testament. I, did they require people, Hebrew in those classes or was it all they English? did not Hebrew was not required at all there was two semesters of Greek required New Testament Greek now believe it or not at St. Vlad's which which to their shame in my opinion they only require one semester of New. what are you going to do with one semester uh, you know and no uh, and don't require Hebrew which basically means just don't even bother about about the Bible but that's that we can discuss that at some point later on but my point was, is that, is that it was a different approach to the Bible. Okay. God is speaking. You're listening. Fortunately for me, I was never an abstract theologian. I mean, even as teenagers, we were discussing theology, but I was not into Nietzsche. I was not into Heidegger and all these, all these other, it just, I, I wouldn't, I couldn't do abstract thought. There was nothing. It was always about application. How do we then live? And for myself, that was that was the bottom line. And so, uh, so even though you know I was a valedictorian of my class and all these other kinds of things, and which means I took all the dogmatic courses, I did all the liturgical theology, all the history, all the patristics, you know, canon on, so and did quite well. Uh, uh, I look back and I shake my head, said, "Oh, what a waste!" You know. If you look at my books now, you know, and I don't want to scandalize people. I I don't have theology books. I gave them all away about 15 years ago. Just here, hundreds of dollars of books because I wasn't ever going to read them again. Okay. So there was a movement and transformation. 
And it is all rooted in, you know, in the seeds that Father Paul planted and then continued to be nurtured uh, when OCAP started, because really that was that was the, the, the key, because there was never any structure for Father Paul to continue to teach beyond just the students he had in his seminary classes. And that's the value of OCAPs. And uh, it's, it's not just value, it's invaluable because it is essential because you get so little in your in your seminary masters of divinity program you get next to nothing next to nothing which is a scandal because <laughs> we give so much priority to other stuff that will not bear fruit because because uh i'm very sort of the disciple of the gospel of matthew if there's got to be fruit and if there's no fruitfulness that is the criteria therefore don't waste your time. So, yeah, anyway. and you're you're of the the first fruits of that. I'm one of the very last uh, fruits of that. I, I I knew a few people personally who learned in in uh, some of uh, the final years uh, of Father Paul at Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, but really it was Father Mark Bulos and Doctor Richard Benton through their podcast work that introduced me, and then I later began reading his books and listening to his audio commentaries, and of course uh, met him. You mentioned an interesting point about the Greek and, and the Hebrew before I want to ask you about if there were any um, particular books of the Bible or or passages that that stuck out to you. I I forget the exact um, part of it, but I, is it the Bar Jesus it's like the introduction? It's a point that Father Paul makes a lot. The introduction to the Septuagint itself talks about how it is an uh, a compromise of sorts to render the Hebrew Bible in the Greek language and that it is being done because of the value of reading it in a language that people are going to understand and it's the lingua franca at the time right, but right. that it inevitably points back to reading whatever the Hebrew original was that's not the Masoretic text but whatever the, right, 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 the Hebrew right. from which yeah. the, the old Greek was translated from because then you could understand the original idioms and and all of the 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 plays on on words right 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 you know the uh the uh i'm not a big fan of social media and the dominance of of uh, a computer in my pockets i understand the value and the use of it and you can't go go back Mm -hmm. But what is allowed is you, through Father Mark, through Father Paul, myself, 44 years ago, I guess we decided, to all of a sudden come together in a vehicle to do what we're doing now uh, in terms of just continuing what was, what was Father Paul's, both his teaching and his writing, and his, he's still with us, so his, his voice, obviously, if anybody knows about Father Paul, it's all about his voice <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, as he's as he's teaching uh, to have a means to continue. You know, twenty years ago, that we wouldn't be having this because it wasn't the technology to be able to ha have it. And so, so you know, OCAPS as when it began uh, was just let's get together one week a year at mm -hmm. a camp and do an intensive. Yeah. Uh, and you know, there still wasn't anybody going on and doing PhDs in scripture, one, two people and whatnot. Most of us, you know, ended up going into, into uh, the priesthood and parish, parish ministry and whatnot. And so, uh, uh, so the, uh, using the modern technology has, has created uh, opportunities, okay? Uh, to continue and to communicate across generations and time and, and space. And, uh, and we see that now. Uh, but back to your question about languages. Uh, one of my sins uh, was that I was given the gift of languages. You know, Hebrew, I was studying at 19. Uh, Greek, you know, 23, 24 and whatnot. But got sidetracked, got sidetracked. 
what did I get sidetracked in? Just the busyness of life. Okay, you're raising, mm -hmm. you're raising, you're raising a large family. You're maybe working two jobs. You you know, you know, at the parish and another job, uh, pastoral concerns. But you were also seduced by theology. Oh, I was seduced years for and spirituality. Okay, so my my language gifts were there, but not being utilized for anything. Uh, because because I didn't reconnect with Father Paul until, you know, sometime later. Uh, because you're talking 1983, I graduated and I went out west, and you know, I didn't come full circle until until uh, uh, closer to 95 when I came back east. So and you weren't in the interim doing those one week intensive. No, they didn't exist. Like they that. didn't exist. They didn't exist until the late 90s. Mm -hmm. into the late 90s because what happened with, with, with Father Paul obviously he was teaching at St. Vlad's but was there was there was a stretch of 10 years uh, around 1994 where he was also teaching at, at Holy Cross what that meant was is, is that he was forming a whole group of students in, 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 in the multi-jurisdictional reality of America from between Holy Cross and St. Vlad's okay, mm -hmm. the two, two largest uh, Orthodox seminaries, you know, not to dismiss St. Tegan's or whatnot, but he was there and he was forming the, and so that created a bridge that would never have happened. And then it just, which then allowed not his teaching and his formation of, of those interested in scripture to broaden. Okay. And that has proved to be invaluable because, because uh, Otherwise, it was just you know the few from the OCA and the Antiochians and the and and a few others at St. Vlad's who, who were getting it. And uh, uh, but he allowed them to uh, uh, you know just simply came up with the idea of let's get together and do these intensives, scatter students that were serious students back in seminary and whatnot, and that want to travel because most of us were were located in the Northeast, so there's a large number, which is why. And he of course he was there, and. Uh, and uh, so that sort of began the, the seeds of what now has emerged as OCABs. And then with that, it's grown with Father Mark and the Ephesus School and so on and so forth. But all as a result of, uh, of the desperate need for more teaching and more intensives, because honestly, seminary didn't provide those. We were just splattered at like one semester, you know, because I was wanted to do as much. I was taking nine classes, nine classes. Okay working because i had to work at nights because i had i you know i started with two kids by the time i left mm -hmm. seminary i had four kids so i was working at nights my wife was working and we were living in in, in, a, in a one bedroom apartment <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's these kinds of things you have to tell your, your kids once in a while that, that they really are a bit spoiled and, and so on <laughs> but we didn't mind it we were happy as could be because we were young energetic and we were learning and we were part of the community which was beautiful and we had fantastic professors so so, we're hey, amen. I'll I'll give you um, a moment if you'll humor me. I'll, I I found the, the passage from the NRSV, which uh, has this uh, this introduction here, um, that that expresses the Septuagint pointing to the Hebrew original. If if you have any passages or books, whether you know Genesis, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Psalms, any any of the big ones, or or any passages that stick out to you I'd, I'd love for you to to think of them as i as i read to the audience a quick uh, paragraph from the nrsv here many great teachings have been given to us through the law and the prophets and the other books or writings that followed them now those who read the scriptures must not only themselves understand them but must also as lovers of learning be able through the spoken and written word to help the outsiders so my grandfather, Jesus, or Joshua, who had devoted himself especially to the reading of the Law and the Prophets and the other books of our ancestors, and had acquired considerable proficiency in them, was himself also led to write something pertaining to instruction and wisdom, so that by becoming familiar also with these things, those who love learning might make even greater progress in living according to the Law or the Teaching. You are invited, therefore, to read it with goodwill and attention and to be indulgent in cases where, despite our diligent labor in translating, we may seem to have rendered some phrases imperfectly. For what was originally expressed in Hebrew does not have exactly the same sense when translated into another language. 
not only this book, but even the law itself, the prophecies, and the rest of the books differ not a little when read in the original. So that that's uh, that's the passage we talked about earlier that that uh, stuck out to me. I don't know if you have uh, anything from from your well, time that stuck what, out what, to you. What what is amazing about that passage is that it is well, he says it all. He says it all. And and it says it all during his time, which is what, 20, 2100 years ago. Uh, the difficulty and the task now, we should have that imprinted on on a, on a tattooed on our foreheads <laughs> so that when we look in the mirror and comb our hair, we were reminded again of the task set before anybody who wants to do biblical exegesis. And we're already told beforehand the difficulty of the process. And uh, uh, so relative to that, I, I don't have any other passages. Again, mm -hmm. it's the idea that uh, that that uh, the word of God is embedded in the writings. And we see all, all this in, in with, with Moses in Deuteronomy, then later on also in Joshua, and then references as well, you know, Ezekiel and the scroll and and uh, and even the humility of John at the end of his gospel, where he says these things have been written that you may you know, the whole world could not contain, you know, the, the hyperbole to make the point that this is meant for instruction. It's a gift to you by whoever is, is writing it. And so treasure it. My complaint is, and the scandal, I think honestly, to me, the biggest scandal, uh, and I can only speak for myself in the Orthodox church that I know is that people are so ignorant of scripture and we, we don't even read the Old Testament in, in the liturgical calendar except during special times during Lent, which is mm -hmm. just blows my mind uh, that seminarians are ignorant of Scripture. We had to take content tests just to, to, to even get in based in, you know, Father Paul saw the ignorance of his students. So his first test was, I'm giving you three books, Genesis, maybe Isaiah, whatnot, and I'm going to pick one, and you have to go as a test, chapter, 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 you know, because of the level of just lack of knowledge, basic knowledge of the stories. Forget about the ancient languages, because those those weren't emphasized in, in the curriculum. And, uh, and, and as you know, we talked earlier about priestly ministry and, and the reduction of the priesthood uh, to serving liturgy and, and such things, and uh, uh, that you have to do something, and this is what we're doing, and, and I think it's all wrong. We have to do exactly what, what, Bar, what uh, Bar Jesus just said. We must study. So, so for example, I was asked by by my recently by my former parish to do a class, Zoom class. Mm -hmm. Because you know he wanted you know uh, the, the priest wanted something a Bible study for the for the parish during during the, the fall, and I said I said I don't I don't do Bible studies. I says I do a class, and these are the terms for the class because I know I know the hard way that if you don't sit and take notes, you will not remember a thing. Ask anybody what, what the last sermon was about. They don't remember. They, don't, they might have some vagueness. It has to do with, with memory capabilities. It, it dissipates quickly, which is why it has to be repeated and repeated. So the idea that the scripture needs to be heard, 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 because it's all about rote learning, repetition, and whatnot. I mean, if you're more zealous, you can memorize. But it is, it is a requirement, because we will not remember. And so I said, I don't see. I can say this now because I'm not yeah. getting paid. And I told them, I said, I am not requiring you to pay anything for 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 these nine classes I'm teaching on on Genesis. Here are the conditions, and here's why. And if you're serious, now, how many of those people actually took notes? I bet, I bet maybe ten percent, which means it's a waste of their time. Now, I can say it's a waste of my time, but no, okay, because I have to do the work and say, and, and, and that's beneficial to me, okay, because, but it goes to the problem that ultimately we're planting seeds. So when we talk about OCABs, 
your podcast, Father Mark's podcast, others, and so on. It's planting seeds. And that requires great faith because, as the parable says, it's going to land all over the place. And just maybe it might sprout. Where? Among the publican, among the Canaanite woman, among the centurion. You see, I mean, that's, you know, the gospel digs us because it's picking all these non-Jews where all of a sudden never have I seen such great faith in all of Israel. Woman, great is your faith. Share the share the crumbs off the table. You know, I'm just a dog, okay? But, you know, God can't resist humility. He falls in love with it wherever it is. So if we humble ourselves, oh, you know, it's just because it's it's a seed that has actually sprouted. So uh, so the uh, the spirituality of of the fathers, honestly. I give that to someone else. Been there, done that. Because who was not attracted as a young 19, 20-year-old about the, the, the church fathers and St. John Climacus? No, I was reading them in, in, in situ in, 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 in Palestine, right? I could go to Marsan, but it was just down the street, okay? Uh, but uh, and, and I visited Mount Sinai. I've climbed it more than once, you see. Uh, uh, but all that is, no, it's the scripture. It's the scripture. Die to yourself. Just listen and do. If you don't understand it, say, I don't understand. You don't know something? You don't know something. Don't ask stupid questions. I was teaching. I did some adjunct teaching for a, a, a Catholic seminary in the Old Testament. And their first assignment was to, uh, was to read the first four chapters of Genesis and give me 20 questions. Just oh. Because I wanted to see what kinds of questions they would ask to see if they were dumb questions and therefore they weren't reading the text or they were related to the text because it told me about what goes on in their mind mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, people have presuppositions and ideas and they read stuff in it and they ask curious questions. No curiosity, okay? no curious questions. Yeah, it's just, it's fruitless, okay? It's a waste of time. I'm always gentle with people. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. want to sort of beat people up, but you know, something is irrelevant then you say well let's look at the decks what is it saying full pause anyway <laughs> no that that's beautiful and um yeah I, I always try to even though like you said it's a I, I don't know if you know this about my education i in college i studied all of western philosophy mm -hmm. and so having studied western philosophy i um I'm a cradle Orthodox, but I had spent a decade or so not going to the church. My right. parents are, for all intents, secular, but they always named, raised me nominally. They've never right. been consistent churchgoers, not even as children. Yeah. Uh, okay. But with kind of, you know, the whole environment, the milieu had these these values, these ethics. So I came back into it more and more, you know, like when I first began Sunday school, I wanted to teach saint cyril's 12 anathemas you know and it's over time uh, yes. that i you know i'll i'll I look between uh <laughs> the disputes between him and uh of alexandria uh and chrysostom and then you you see those those sparks of ingenuity over time of those people within uh the orthodox church broadly understood you know the church i should say broadly understood from those those giants in the church even amongst uh, the fathers who who understood that message and you you continue to sow that seed i don't want to uh, hold you any longer but i want to make sure we do a proper a plug uh tis the season uh giving tuesday's already passed but the, let's say the season continues and continues the website that i know of is ocabspress.org ocabs right. yeah. press.org yeah. And I know if you scroll to the bottom of the page, there's a, a donate button there. Is there any elevator pitch you want to do for for OCABs? And uh, I, I, I genuinely encourage it. And because I've I've gained so much from it, uh, I think I told you privately, it's it's so funny that I have introduced so many people to OCABs in the Ephesus School that sometimes they come back to me and try to tell me about it as if right. I'm not the person. Right, right. The newbie. Yeah. <laughs> Which is which is that's my that's my favorite is that they forget so that I don't get any credit at all. I actually there you that's go. What I there want. you go. There you go. Uh, well, uh, OCAPs began as a, as as a simple labor 
of love and desire to continue intensive uh, study of the scripture. And as you said, it started with, with just uh, once a year, a week session of in intensive lectures where we would sit and take notes for five, six hours a day. Uh, and now it has broadened out uh, really through Father Paul, of course, writing and then uh, Father, Father Mark Bulos spearheading the whole publishing aspect of it as that became a, an easy option, an inexpensive option because it's on-demand publishing, which allowed something like us to establish a press. Otherwise, it would not have been possible. And with that, it means that that we're allowed to publish with we, whatever we want. We're not being censored by a seminary press or a larger press or whatnot, you know, because it's not about sales. It's not about sales. It's about providing the opportunity for people. And most of people who are writing are, are not PhDs, okay? Apart from Father Paul, put him, he's by far the lot. Uh, so I'm my point is sure. that OCABS had, had begun and the circumstances has allowed this development everybody's doing no one gets paid we are a nonprofit. not a single penny goes to anybody now if someone writes a book they get royalties and whatnot which is which is as as should be and uh and uh and all these podcasts that you everybody's doing, it's it's done freely out of out of love for the gospel and the desire to share and to teach you know sort of what what you read there from uh bar jesus but uh, so in that sense uh and the latest uh, you know and there hence the plug is that you know father paul wants to establish an endowment which which he has by 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 offering the first ten thousand dollars to establish an endowment as as a, a way to again to support those people down the road who may need to have uh, you know offsets the expenses of pursuing again biblical studies uh it could be teachers it could be christian education things that are relevant to the scripture as their offering, you see, as as uh, as that which is required, you know, Father Paul continues to stress that. Excuse me, as you know, he's pushing me to write a book on on, on Matthew. It says this is not a choice. You have an obligation before God to do it. Okay, so so as an obedience. So again, this but this idea that freely it has been given to us. So freely we, we must we must uh, under under the uh, threat of judgment. Uh, continue to do that. And, and that is the spirit of OCABS. And it's going to stay that way. We're not going to be a big organization. We're not going to do mass marketing. We're not, we're simply going to try to produce. And this is the freedom that, 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 that we have each of, okay, is we are not like Father Paul, nor should we mimic him or try to produce like, no, 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 do our own work. You know, if you disagree with him, Look at the scripture, look at the languages, and, and disagree with him. He has no problem with that. This isn't sort of a, a monolithic sort of, of we're having an ecumenical council and coming up with a final statement. No, no. So it's this freedom and discouragement because, of, and so then this give and take. That being said, donation. It is all uh, the donations. Really, it's the first time we've asked ever asked for donations, and that is for the endowment fund to build it up to ultimately... Uh, uh, enable people who might need some financial assistance in and pursuing their 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 studies to uh, to come to us and we can help. But but it has to be an area of scripture because that's 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 what we're about. That's the laser focus, and I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Toda, Shukran, all of the fun, <laughs> and we look forward uh, not only to the resurrection of the dead, but to your book on Matthew. <laughs> uh, uh, gonna, see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna myself to be squeezed again <laughs> after the uh, first of the year. I'm doing Genesis right now, which I need to do before I do Matthew. By the way, <laughs> okay, Genesis comes first. That that makes. I'm not sense. no study the, the study of Genesis. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that yeah, that's good. We look forward to your current work, and always know that this uh, channel will always be open to, nice to uh, furthering the sowing of that seed. And it's because it's it bears repeating, as you as you mentioned, because we're so recalcitrant and disobedient, we need to be told like a broken record over and over again. So thank you so much for your time, uh, Abuna. Absolutely.